Whoa, that's loud. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the GDC Twitch channel. My name is Brian Francis. I am a contributing editor at GodMustFuture.com. I'm a community manager for GDC. I am, uh, unfortunately, invisible, as always. Uh, hanging out, whispering into your ears, uh, whispering into this uh, fine gentleman's ears. Um, uh, we are here today playing a game called Creature in the Well. Um, I'm going to try and tweak something while we're playing here. Um, Creature in the Whale is a hack and slash pit, kind of pinball meets Zelda kind of game. Uh, yeah, you guys are going to see that, aren't you? All right, let's try and move that over there. There we go. Okay. Um, it is, uh, as you can see here, as my little, my little robot is trying to navigate this desert. Um, it's sort of a top-down game. Uh, what's going to get really interesting and unique about it is, A, the look, which you can sort of see about right now, and B, um, this very, it's got, even though it's got a dungeon crawling kind of, top-down design the mechanics you aren't fighting monsters instead you're uh not using one of two tools to knock both energy balls around to power up this factory um and also here's the thing that made me want to check out this game here is the 20 foot tall skeleton um uh that <laughs> is creeping around in the background um for folks at home uh, who are new to the gdc channel uh this is a channel where we talk to developers about interesting games they're working on to share knowledge with you about making them so if you have questions uh for our guest you can ask them in Twitch chat, and I will grab them for our guest. Speaking of which, I should finally introduce him. Our guest uh, is Adam Volker. Adam, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. And you work for uh, Flight School Studio, right? I do. I sure do. I was this close to saying uh, Night School, and I remember Ooh, that's the studio no. here in L.A., no, that... and I was like, wait, no. And I was like, Flight Those School. Those guys suck. They're, no, no, they're they're great. No, I know. They're friends. They're gonna... their, their, their game is really cool looking and they're lovely people yeah oh my god and then oxen free was really good yeah great yeah. loved oxen free anyway um but we're not here to talk about oxen free uh we're here to talk <laughs> about uh creature in the well uh adam i just told them what creature in the well is um what do you think creature in the well is and what do you do on <laughs> creature in the well that's a good question too yeah i mean uh man creature in the well is a pet project um for my colleague Bowden and i mm -hmm. been dying to make um a kind of video game that we thought was a little different a little wacky and as beautiful as we can make it. But I think, you know, calling it a pinball hack and slash is the quickest, most succinct way to to describe what it is. Yeah. For those watching at home, uh, the basic mechanic is on display here where I'm using uh, one of my tools to hit the balls around. Soon I will get the other tool and uh, that will let me charge up the balls. But yeah, as you can see, it is those are pinball bumpers. These are balls that you launch. Uh, you navigate from room to room and you... that. Again, the, the twenty foot tall skeleton is kind of your your nemesis here. Although I'll have some thoughts about him later. Um, cool. Adam, uh, you talked with some other uh, outlets about where this game came from. for our audience. What was kind of the foundation of Creature in the Well, and what was what did it look? What was kind of the first thing that made you go, "Oh, this is a game we can ship," uh, <laughs> as opposed to just uh, this is a great mechanic that's going to take us twenty. Yeah, years that's to make that's a, a good two part question. The we started the project as a sort of competitive multiplayer, local co-op multiplayer game. Yeah. Um, it was going to be like air hockey with, with a character. Um, and we built that prototype, and it was a lot of fun to play, but we started to add, like, little pylons to it. And we're like, well, these pylons are cool. Wouldn't it be cool if they were, like, pinball? They had, you know, bells and bouncers and all that sort of stuff. And then we started adding more of those, and we're like, well, maybe we just make a game about that instead. Mm -hmm. um, multiplayer was something we were toying with, but was a little too much to chew on. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, like as we built these rooms, we found that that was like really fun uh, mechanically to mess with. Um, when we found out we could ship it, was actually much later in development. Uh, you know, like you can see the project where you want it to go much earlier than it actually gets there. Mm -hmm. And um, it was some third-party feedback, actually, we got mm -hmm. uh, that was like, I don't know that you guys have anything yet. And it was a big moment in development for Bo and I to be like, wow, we really need to kind of dig deeper into what we've built and mm -hmm. uh, expand the mechanics. Um, and that's kind of where the dungeons, the eight dungeons that each have like a different mechanical theme all came from. Um, before that, it was a, just a little less challenging. There wasn't quite as much progression in it. Um, so I would I would call those two realizations very different parts of development. Right. Uh, your role in the project, you're a creative director and also the art director, right? Yeah, and like I said, it's a it's a team mostly of two people, and so there's a lot of overlap. But my principal job is to manage the style, the story, um, and then a lot of the level design. 
Right on. Yeah, let's talk about uh, level design for a minute. Um, sure. What's kind of the underlying logic of, uh, like, we're right now seeing some introductory puzzles, but we'll see some more complicated stuff later. What was kind of the, what's the core logic for building a pinball puzzle like this? I love this right, part where so, you just get fried. Yeah. <laughs> so you go room by room. We tried to make sure that everything was kind of like uh, the puzzles would be built so players would walk into them and have to activate them, have sort of a, a twist or a conceit in them, and then... Mm -hmm. Um, solve them within a room. So uh, the progression was something we could also sort of plan dungeon by dungeon. So we knew like, let's put something that's just difficult, like uh, this room for instance doesn't have a lot of challenge, but it's fun to like let the players just mess around and bounce a ball around every once in a while. Yeah. Um, but the but it's always kind of like activating the puzzle was a big part of like what we built the design around. Yeah. And then each dungeon has a mechanical theme. So it was like what you activated would change um, and then there's, uh, man, I, it's hard to describe. Like the last room had what we would call like an AOE bumper. Yeah. We have just like boring dev names for these things, Air, but area it, of effect it, bumper. Yeah. Sure. It shoots a, yeah. it shoots like a beam out in a line. So when we were building one of the dungeons around, like these ones here, when we were building dungeons around that, it was like, can we put them in a cross and then alternate with ones that, uh, you know, go horizontally, um, Bo made tools for me to uh, set timers on them so I could make them fire in rapid succession mm -hmm. to try to move the player around the room. We wanted to make sure that we weren't letting players just kind of hit the ball and stand in a corner and let the puzzle win itself. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really important to like put the ball where you would get the dispenser, like had to be in a dangerous area or had to um, come from like something that would shoot the ball at you. Um, Providing a ball to the player was another huge challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, making sure there was always one available, making sure they were respawning at the right speed, making sure that um, there weren't so many that you uh, you could get them anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right on. Um, I'm going to uh, loop over to loop over to chat real quick. Uh, give folks a chance to get some questions answered. Um, uh, I'm told that the answer to when this game can be played, the answer is uh, soon, although you might have seen it if you dropped by PAX or GDC or E3 recently. Um, uh, Ed Rocked would know, like to know, uh, what is the roughly the playthrough time on this game, and are there plans for DLC? Which I guess is like, I'll uh, I, 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 if you can answer Ed's question, that'd be great. And then my follow-up question would be, um, uh, when you're planning a game like this, um, how do you gauge out what the light, right playthrough time would be for a game like this yeah um so we did a bunch of testing in our discord server and we had some players come in at about 10 hours mm -hmm. um that's not necessarily like a hundred percent complete content but that's like through the story mm -hmm. uh Bowden and i take uh about half of that to play through now mm -hmm. when we play through so i think it's safe to assume somewhere between five and ten is what like an average playthrough the game will take mm-hmm um, as far as extra content, there are some mechanics that we haven't um, used in, the, in this game that maybe we would be cool to put into stuff later, but there's nothing official about that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like I think we wanted to make something that offered players like a, a main through line where they could complete it in a shorter amount of time, but then a bunch of secrets they could also discover if they wanted to, you know, extend. Uh, how long you know their their play through the game was? Right on. I also want to highlight uh, what I'm sure you're. You must be like shouting at me pre to to like we'll just walk over and hit the glowing thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I like how like the game is clearly telling me uh, go hit the glowing thing, and I just walked away from it and walked into town for a minute. Um, uh, moving on from that question, thank you, Ed Rocked. Um, uh, what I would like to know is I'm going to a question point. I totally had something. Um. Uh, there's kind of an element in this game of the fact that puzzles can be skipped. You're going to see later on that, like, there's just moments where I just, I've had it, I've had it, I've got enough power, I'm moving on from the puzzle. What was kind of your design decision for making, like, kind of creating this broader, um, sp players don't need to make every, clear every puzzle to advance. What was kind of your just thought process around that? Yeah, I think this is, this is sort of a two-part answer. Um, the first part is kind of a difficulty question. So, like, if there's a puzzle that is either, like, not communicated well, how it's supposed to be solved, or um, it's just too difficult, or maybe you're under-leveled, we wanted players to be able to opt out of that and still progress through the game. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think, like, the second part is about resource management. So every time you hit a bumper, uh, you'll see numbers pop up, even these yeah. bubbles here. 
uh, and that's your currency of the game. Mm -hmm. um, and managing that currency isn't super important, maybe in the first dungeon, but definitely in the later dungeons, you'll have the ability to spend that on teleporters to make the dungeon run back to the boss fight easier. You'll have the ability to spend that currency to level up mm -hmm. in town. Uh, and then so managing that when the temples start to branch and the exploring becomes a bigger thing um, is a lot of why we allowed players to like skip forward um, some of the rooms they didn't want to spend time in. Yeah. Um, there are there are places where you know we'll let a player sort of we'll reset the bumpers. They're all on a timer, so each of the rooms reset, mm -hmm. um, and we'll let players if they want to grind out uh, to get more power to like level up everything, unlock everything, you know, unlock all the teleporters. Uh, but we wanted to give them the option to do it or not do it. Right on. Um, uh, t t uh, um, let's talk about the uh, camera perspective for this game. How did you and Bo kind of come together on, like, uh, there's sort of a lot of ways this camera could have gone. You could have literally just made a set fixed perspective of pinball, like make it look like a pinball table. Sorry for the, any frame hitching you see in the video, by the way. That's my recording setup, not the game itself. Um, uh, what was kind of your thoughts on designing a camera for this game, one that could keep everything clearly visual for, and visualized for the player? Yeah, good question. So um, the way the camera works is that uh, room by room, I set it, um, Bo writes some uh, incredible tools, like uh, there's a camera volume. So in Unreal, like I create a, there's a box. And every time the player enters the box, I blend it from the camera, or the, mm -hmm. the game, I don't blend it, the game blends it from the camera it was in to one that I set. I can set things like FOV, distance, rotation, all that other stuff. Um, and so what I tried to do was find a nice hybrid between like a shot that I wanted to compose and then what was good for gameplay. Um, we found really, really quickly that the game is super crappy to play when it, the camera's low because aiming is really difficult. So like as close to, directly above the player as possible is is better for gameplay mm -hmm. um but i've always you know kind of wanted to like you know make it more cinematic both bo and i come from a film background and so there's a few hallways and a few rooms where like could really take the camera low and have it track the player mm -hmm. as you're running to try to get interesting shots and make it feel dynamic but what's cool is like we can fix it room by room so if there's a particular puzzle that the camera i've chosen makes it too difficult it's easy to just go in there and fix yeah um, and there's also a setting on it uh, to decide how much the player is tracked. So I can like uh, lock it so it doesn't move, and you'll notice in this room it drifts a little when you move. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just another like cool value to tweak um, as we make the puzzle. So when I would make a puzzle, it would be like load up an empty room and then fill it with a design, set a camera, play it a bunch of times, have Bo play it, and and just kind of tweak as we go. Right on. Um What's kind of is there any kind of effective like broad guideline you observed about the game's camera that like anything you interesting you learned about impl that that you think another developer could benefit from? Um, I mean, if they're making a pinball hack and slash game, I've got a lot of specific advice. Um, I I think like uh, aiming something um, really made wow. I'm so glad you got this on the first try. Nobody gets this puzzle on the first try. Yeah. Um, <laughs> pro gamer Brian Francis. Right yeah, here. pro gamer. Um, like the, like I said, the top-down thing was really important. I had to figure that out as we went. Um, blending it from like more than a 90-degree angle from room to room was really, really caused us a lot of bugs. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be something I would avoid. We'd end up with cameras that would literally like whip around 180 degrees if like I'd set something incorrectly, mm -hmm. uh, um, and like you know. I don't know, like the entrance to the room was on the right side and the camera volume, the camera needed to be on the left and it was coming from a room that had the opposite setup, the camera would really struggle to spin around. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just kind of like stuff you can't really find out until you you know, you know run the game as is intended. Right on. Um, uh, there's a good question in chat about engineering I do want to get to, but uh, before I do, you talked about, before about using camera to control the mood for this game. Um, yeah. I don't know why I came back here. Uh... Why, did I, why aren't you going through the door past me? Um, oh, yeah, I guess I was trying to see if I could control that ball through the door. Um, uh, anyway, so the the question I have about Mood, uh, you, di you mentioned some other interviews that you're super inspired by Mike Mignola. Um, and this does kind of have a Hellboy BPRD look about it. Awesome. Um, uh, from, man, I got that on the first side, too. Yeah, um, those, are, those are difficult shots to make. Yeah. 
Um, uh, what what I wanted to know is, um, so this game has kind of like you can see what between the numbers bouncing up and the the kind of high scorey elements, but there's kind of an arcadey component to the game. But there's mm -hmm. also, as we've seen, like this very moody, deliberate aesthetic going on. Like the kind of you, I think in another interview described it as Oscar the Grouch as a bad guy. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> As kind of one of your inspirations, like this kind, of, there's kind of a deliberate mood about this, like weird apocalyptic setting you're in. Can you talk about the decision to not to make it stylized in the single and not just kind of a high score charging single player experience? Yeah, so mm, that's an interesting question. I think like I, I think a lot of this. Wow, how do I answer that? Um, Bo and I build the pro. We're building the game piecemeal, mm -hmm. and it had a lot of inspirations when we started. Um, but it's kind of like one step at a time, like that's working, that's not working. Yeah. And and so like what you end up with as a final product is just an amalgamation of all of those little decisions along the way. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think like we wanted something really dark and moody. Uh, the character who was speaking to the player out of a trash can turned into the creature. Um, we needed darkness to put him in, but we didn't, but we wanted him to feel large and scary. And like every time we would make a decision, the whole game would sort of have to adapt and grow to that decision. Mm -hmm. um, and all along the way, we're just trying to retain, you know, the mood, the feeling, the camera, and the arcadiness that we wanted, hoping that all of those elements would speak well together and not be, you know, not um, compete, mm -hmm. but that they that they would harmonize. Um, so, so it's interesting that you're pointing out like it's arcadey but also really moody. Um, hopefully, those things work well together. Uh, but it wasn't really ever a decision to try to to mash something disparate with something that wouldn't blend with it, you know. Right on. Uh, that was another hard shot I pulled together. Um, I can now grab Nathrakis's question. Uh, um, obviously, Bo was obviously sounds like he was kind of your tools guy, um, and he was doing a little more of the programming side. But what kind of engineering challenges did you face? Excuse me, with a game like this, uh, this is an Unreal, right? Yes, it is. Yeah, it's in UE4. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, like. Like you, you're correct. Bo is the tech side of the development, so I'll do my best to answer on his behalf. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure if he's watching, he's rolling his eyes already. Um, but uh, I guess look, one of the things that we did um, was was he really wanted to get right was player movement. Um, that's something that he iterated on a lot. How the animation, like how quickly the animation responded, um, you know, how aiming worked, uh, whether we rooted the player, uh, which we do. Um, when you're charging the ball, um, how, fish, how fast the dash operates, all that sort of stuff, mm -hmm. um, was, was a huge, was sort of a huge challenge. It's an ongoing thing. Character control is like really important to him. Um, the other thing that's kind of anecdotal, which is cool, is we originally made the game to handle the dungeons procedurally. So Bo built a bunch of tools for that to work, and then later in development, we decided that wasn't the game we wanted to make, um, and, and we got rid of a lot of those, a lot of that work. Um, but we're still able to keep like uh, the way the rooms connected. So my job was to build basically these art boxes. Mm -hmm. uh, like I built this room without any bumpers in it, uh, and then I would set doors and where they connected and what type of door they were. And Bo had written all these tools to create the dungeon so that anywhere I connect, I could connect any two doors together, um, and then any room could hypothetically be connected to any other room. Um, but and all, some of that stuff carried over from when we had originally, you know, made the game as uh, procedural um, before we changed it to be, you know, handcrafted. Right on. Uh, this is. I'm actually really glad you finished answering right there because this is a great moment to talk about. Uh, that was the first time I died in this game, and uh, I got grabbed by the titular creature in the well. There's the creature. There's the well. There's the. Anyway. Um, uh... This death loop is really interesting to me because you can, you know, you die, uh, you get a moment with the villain of the game where you just sort of like get to stare down at each other a little bit, and then you walk back through the dungeon. You're going to see it happen a couple more times, but it's kind of, um, it's a death loop. It's an interesting death loop to me because it's not as, um, it's not, you know, as roguelike, like, oh, you died, like, some stuff gets retained, but you lose other stuff. It's not, it doesn't have that same, like, loop function to it, but that's still, like, that looping failure back into into the flow of the game feels pretty good here um and it's an interesting decision especially when later as you see like i actually fail and then i have to walk a pretty significant ways back and i have to take a long walk back through where i've been how, how did you sort of come to the decision to implement it that way 
Yeah, so that was about storytelling for us. It was kind of making sure that the player interacted with the creature mm -hmm. and that we made them feel like um, he was always watching. Um, I think it makes you feel really vulnerable for him, the villain, to like pick you up and physically move you. Mm -hmm. um, it reiterates that he doesn't want you doing, you know, what you're doing and fixing the machine and going back into the mountain. Mm -hmm. um, and then we just, you know, we encourage you gently to read the dialogue we wrote for the, for the story parts of the game. Um, and so all of that, we just felt like I'm glad you, I'm glad you feel that way, because uh, all of that we felt like was was reinforcing like the relationship with the creature, the story, and like um, you know all of that stuff. Uh, the run, it's interesting that you mentioned the run because that is another point that we really, really wanted to, we really uh, paid close attention to. Um, right after you died, you actually walked up to a door in town that had a red blinking light. Mm -hmm. Later in the game, once you complete more of the dungeons, that door opens and makes your run back much quicker. Mm -hmm. And then this room actually turns into a teleporter if you spend money uh, later in the dungeon to unlock it, uh, you can teleport right to the boss room. So both of those devices were ways that we made that easier for players that they wanted it to be, the run to be a little shorter. But um, we felt like the story win we were getting out of having the creature pull you back to town was cool. Nice. Um, uh, moving through my question pile here. Um, uh, there's kind of an interesting thing that you talked about in another interview I was watching. We talked about making sure that rooms don't beat themselves. Um, yeah. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, what's the danger of, like, setting up a room like that, and why was it something you wanted to avoid? Well, I think it just makes for a boring game. You know, if, if like, a player can just bounce the ball and then, you know, nothing, uh, you know, they don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, if the game's solve like, in design, like, if a game is solvable, that's really bad. Uh, meaning that, like, if there's a, only one solution to beat it, and um, that solution is really clear to the player at the beginning, and there's not a lot of thinking, then then it's not as interesting to play, and et cetera, et cetera. So um, a couple ways we tried to handle that was to make the puzzles activatable, like I was mentioning before. There's also a lot of um, engineering under the hood about how long a ball will bounce without you interacting with it. Mm -hmm. So you'll notice the ball's changing color. That's based on the player level. Uh, makes them more powerful. They'll they'll complete a bumper. They'll fill a bumper with power in less hits. Um, but if you don't hit them, um, they'll own, they'll slowly lose power, and then they will only bounce three times, um, and then they'll disappear. So like turning turning the balls into these like sort of abstract energy things was a was a big part of like fixing that solvability. Apologies for the folks at home. We are having you. Uh, we did not get to see that entire puzzle because unfortunately, <laughs> uh, this is a great game with uh, uh, some high particle with some particles moving very quickly across the screen, which means that's what causes uh, load on the CPU when you're trying to record footage. Um, uh, moving. Oh man. Like, chat said too we missed that beautiful just moment of chaos. <laughs> um, yeah are, those are kind of our like breakout plinko rooms where like if you get if you sneak a ball into the back of it the whole it's like that really satisfying yeah. thing where you're playing breakout and you can get a ball to bounce up under the corner yeah yeah uh that's a good yeah man it's a good breakout like that's a good game to reference here i think yes um, of course I mean, through development that was one of our major references yeah i really love this room because it feels like a batting cage yeah um, uh, um, uh, you, uh, talked somewhere about, uh, um, speed games done quick, SD, SDQ, um, yep. uh, and how you were working with speedrunners for some testing on this game. Um, what was kind of, we've, we've, we've done, I've done an article about this in the past. We've been interested in how, uh, game developers kind of learn from high speed players. Um, what was kind of the thing you learned, like working with speedrunners to test your game? Yeah, and again, I'll. This is a bow. This is a bow question because this is near and dear to his heart. But mm -hmm. I will try to remember all the things he was saying while he was making the game as good as it is. Um, it's it's kind of about like if you were. It's it's really difficult to look at a game that you're making objectively. Obviously, you spend all this time laboring over, you know, trying to design a puzzle that like you think is really cool, and it might be bad. Mm -hmm. You know, it might just be boring or not interesting or whatever. And so I think when we when we would always talk about speed running, Bo would say, is there a way a player will skip this because they can do it faster a different way? Mm -hmm. And that was a really good question to review what we'd made with. 
So it would be like, yeah, I, he would be like, I know you spent all day on this, but I can just beat it, you know, by cheating, quote unquote cheating, and standing over in this, do, doing it this way. And I would, we would have to change it for that reason, right? So I think when we when we think about like doing it quickly and trying to optimize, it's it's a bit like optimizing the gameplay, right? Um, that's that's when speed running and and that stuff comes into play. Right on. Uh, um, you also, uh, like I said, you've taken this tour onto a bunch of shows. Um, is there anything you've learned about displaying at uh, shows like PAX and stuff and getting feedback from players that helped you guys out on this game? Oh, for sure. I think the first time we showed it was at uh, GDC, and um, you know we had a demo version then, but we definitely went back to the tutorial. It's always the beginning of the game that gets iterated on the most, I think. Mm -hmm. We went back to that part a lot after we saw... Um, you know, we, we put the game in the hands of a bunch of new players. Um, we try to do as much testing as we can with friends and family, you know, in the middle of development, but showing it like officially announcing the game and all of that, you really, um, you really learn a lot of new stuff about what assumptions you've made. And the mechanic is so different and new that like teaching it is really, really important. And so that those first three or four rooms in the game, you know, are probably like the newest rooms in the game. Yeah. Right on. Yeah, actually, speaking of like how new and different this mechanic is, um, there's a lot of you know common language in game development, like a sword. When you swing a sword like this, it should do kind of this. Um, right. Your game does things differently in specific ways, but it's also you know there's like there's some conventional aspects, there's some unconventional aspects. Um, what have you learned about like designing game elements to help players understand what they are? Like kind of these these orange things are an interesting example because they're not enemies that you hack and slash to kill they're energy things that can be dispelled with the ball like um, they start yeah. to swarm you and add pressure like like what have you learned about like designing in-game elements that are abstract but like you know like they're they're pinball they might be pinball-y and conventional and pinball but they might not make sense in a hack and slash yeah that's a that's a good question these those particular enemies are still kind of a sticking point for me and Bo I think like we we decided to make them killable by the ball and not the sword because we want to make sure that the player's thinking about the ball always. Yeah. Um, but it is it, it. I have noticed like a player after player find that not um, super intuitive. Um, so it's 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 a difficult thing to answer. I um, we sort of operate on the design philosophy that we've stolen from a filmmaker. Uh, <laughs> His name is Steven Spielberg. <laughs> it's just some random filmmaker. He, uh, his company Amblin Entertainment uh, put out this idea that like um, audiences like newness in a in sort of like a 70-30 relationship to things they already know. So 70% being um, things that people understand with a twist. So it's our world, but there's an island of dinosaurs, or mm -hmm. it's suburban California, except there's an extraterrestrial that lives with a small boy. Uh, or befriends a small boy, um, and so we were like, "It's a they're swords, but they don't behave the way you expect." Or it's a dungeon crawler, but it's full of rooms with pinballs mechanics. Yeah. Um, I think like if it was all super abstract and new, we would have a lot more work to do to tell people about it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think like it's important for players to look at the game and go, "Oh, I can see how that would be fun." Yeah. And um, I understand the format of how I'm going to play that, and that's really important to us, so that you know it's not just it, it's just fun. You, you know, you should be able to like under speak the language fairly quickly, even if there's a lot of newness. So, so like that's why we went with swords, and that's why we went with dungeons and and rooms and connect boss fights and connecting them all that way. Right on, right on. Do you think that's helped you? I don't know how hands-on you've been with any of the marketing for the game because you have some support from uh, Pop Agenda and stuff. But uh, um, uh, what um, uh, w do you think that's helped you like explain the game to people as you've tried to like get it out in the world and convince people to buy it when it comes out? Looks at spreadsheet soon. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I basically just say whatever they tell me. That's that's how I know it's good. And appropriate, um, but really, like a lot of the messaging comes from players. Mm -hmm. uh, the first time we played it at um, at GDC, somebody called it a pinball hack and slash, and then the next PAX East show we brought it to, somebody said pin brawler, and um, and like it's it's players being able to tell you, you know, like oh, this is how I would describe it to a friend is has been the best way to continue to talk about it. 
Mm -hmm. uh, because Bo and I have all this baggage about what it used to be, what it used to look like. It used to be a multiplayer game. It used to be have a lot more RNG in it and stuff like that. So um, it's it's kind of just like about listening, I think. Nice. Right on. Okay, we've got about 25, 30 minutes left in our show here. Uh, if you got questions, keep them rolling. We'd love to, we'd love to ask them for you. Um, uh, ba -ba -ba, um, you, uh, um, so Flight School Studio, um, also does a lot of work in VR development. You all have a cool, um, World War One experience with Hardcore History's Dan Carlin out there. Um, I know you didn't work on that one specific, or I don't know if you did, you mentioned that. Um, no, I didn't. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, you did, you have said you've done some work in VR. Um, I know this is sort of a tricky question, but I'm curious how... Have you, as a developer, like joining a company that's doing work work for hire on VR projects and work doing um, interesting? Like, what's that been like working at this company compared to other game design jobs you've done before? Um, so, I think what's cool about what Flight School does is that um, our media we work in all sorts of like real time mediums, whether it's mm -hmm. augmented reality or virtual reality, or just gaming. Um, and we, it's, it makes our team look at design abstractly. Yeah. And so, um, some of the VR stuff that I have done at Flight School, uh, has been both narrative and gaming oriented, mm -hmm. but, uh, we try to ask really fundamental questions about the way people use those devices and what sort of thing we want to make yeah. and how it would be best on that device. So mm -hmm. wouldn't, you know. Like one of the, my pet peeves is like joysticks on a phone, you know, those digital joysticks. Yeah. I feel like uh, we try to avoid things like that. And I'm trying to say this in a positive way. We try to design for the platform, right? Yeah. Um, and so it, what's been really cool about coming from that VR background is we're always asking like those big questions throughout as much of the development process as we can. So, um, that's really let like when we started making creature it was like well if we're gonna make a game it needs to feel like it belongs on the platforms that we would want to play it on and that and, and that affects the way it looks and the way it plays and the mechanic i think that's part of where the arcadiness came from and it's definitely where the visuals came from um and since sort of stuff like that right on uh, i mean and that does that um does that mindset i i know you didn't necessarily design this with the nintendo switch first in mind um, but does that does the Nintendo Switch as a device like make you think about making games differently than it does? Uh, oh yeah, say Steam. Yeah, for sure. I think like uh, you need like because hmm, like I play my Switch a bunch on docked at home, but I also find some of the most fun I have with it is when I'm on the go. Making something that was graphic that could read at a small size was huge. You know, like I think. Yeah. Um, we weren't, you know, developing and putting it on the Switch like every month or whatever, but um, we did have it in the back of our minds as we were developing. Uh, we started the game on PC, obviously. Um, and uh, and then when we put it on the Switch, it was like a lot of, lot of review of the UI, a lot of like tweaking of the colors. Like it was very easy to get back into these dungeons and say like, let's make this a little brighter. Let's make the contrast a little higher so that you can see the player. That sort of stuff was stuff we tweaked, you know, with all that in mind. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it definitely affects it. You want it to, you want it to look good where people are going to play it. So mm -hmm. um, it's it would be foolish not to review it that way. Right on. Uh, comments from chat. Uh, Madame Lebeau would like to know if uh, use the touch screen on the Switch, which is real, really interesting, weird feature the Switch has that touch screen. It is cool. We don't use it. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't use it a lot when I'm playing games on my own because I don't want to dirty it. My it's weird. Like it's a screen. It's not like the DS, which sort of like gave you permission to tap away on the bottom screen. Like uh, the Switch feels as delic more delicate than my iPhone in some ways. Um, yeah. So I don't want to like rub my dirty fingers all over it. Um, <laughs> but it's so wild. The Nintendo was like, oh no, yeah, we're gonna keep like mobile touchscreen functionality. I guess that's helped them like port. You know, some companies port mobile games to the to the platform. Sure. It's just me pontificating. Um, uh, John Nova would like to know what was the most complicated part of development for you? Getting the design right. Mm -hmm. I, I mentioned earlier the um, sort of that third party who came in middle of development and was like, "I'm not sure, you guys." That was really hard feedback to get, but was really, really, really helpful. Um, at that point, we you know we had sort of maybe rooms like this, but they weren't. Um, this was probably the best of the that the design had at that point. Um, 
we sort of had this big moment where we're like, okay, let's gut everything that we've built. And Bo made, as he saved, he saved me again, as he usually does. He made eight example rooms. What he did was just kind of like, okay, I'm going to stop what I'm doing for the week and make and try to take the game and create eight really, really unique um, puzzles that all have different, super different mechanics. Um, and he actually ended up having to create a bunch of new stuff for that. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really good to to really try to take the pinball hack and slash mechanic and spread it out as wide as it could be so that players got something different as they played through the whole game and it wasn't just hundreds of rooms of the same sort of stuff. Um, and then once he built those example rooms, we reviewed those for their uniqueness and then I tried to build the dungeons based on his example. So all of those, that's kind of how our design process works is Bo would be like, I think this has something unique and this is what I was going for. And then I would expand it into the dungeon. And then, you know, we would obviously be bouncing. He'd have an idea to make a room and then we would fine tune each other's designs. But uh, that was really one of the toughest parts of, of getting something that felt like a whole game. You know, it was it was kind of always a prototype until that moment, I think. Right on. That, that's a really good answer, I think. Um, uh, I want to talk about that this this mysterious stranger, this mysterious third party who came in and said there wasn't a lot there. <laughs> um, uh, I guess they're going to remain unnamed, but... Um, uh, well, I don't know. I don't know, Jen. Can I mention who it was? Yeah. Yeah, so it's uh, a guy named Nigel from Devolver. Oh, yeah. And, Nigel um, and we were talking to him about the game, and he was like, it's cool, but I'm not sure. Um, and I really, really appreciate the feedback, so shout out to Nigel. Right on, shout out to Nigel. Um, really quick, uh, the where I was getting to with that is, um, as a designer, um, I think I think a lot of game designers and game developers are very used to critical feedback. They're used to, um, you know, every ideas aren't precious. They are meant to be worked on and then moved on from. Um, yeah. But when you get feedback like that, You've been working on something. You're trying to find a vision for it. You're trying to find a future for it. Um, you described a very good reaction to that to that feedback, which is what you and Bo did, which which trying to realign like how dun progression in dungeons work. But what's kind of your your mentality for getting that feedback and saying this is proactive feedback that I can use to make this better, and not oh no, this means we should stop working. It's not it's not good enough. Like what's kind of the the, the, the difference? to get you across that threshold, I think. It's a little more abstract. Yeah, question. yeah, that's a tough one. It's about, um, it's about mm, mood, but, you know, game developers deal with that all the time, is my opinion. Yeah, no, definitely. You know, sometimes you don't want to hear it, and sometimes uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> um, sometimes you're like, I know it's bad, and people tell you yeah, it's bad, and you're like... I think that... Ooh, wow. Like, how stubborn is do you want to be is kind of the is kind of the question you have to ask yourself. You believe, like, you believe in something, um, and... You have to decide whether, like, you're lying to yourself about its quality, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's something you like, um, and maybe a lot of, like, people generally don't. I think that we really, really take, we really watch new players play something that is new for us, and we and we say, like, is there genuine excitement and interest in, in what we've built, or are we lying to ourselves about, like, something we love that maybe isn't resonating with people? Mm -hmm. I think... In the case of Nigel's feedback, um, it wasn't that, like, this isn't a game. It was that I don't know that this is going to scale to a full experience was his was specifically what he told us. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't – and, you know, we're, we're reading between the lines because I think for him it was kind of, you know, it was a first blush at the game. Like, he hadn't played a lot of it. We, we were in the middle of development. It wasn't – you know, so um, I don't even know that he knows how important it was. <laughs> Um, but it, it was it was kind of like we had to decide. Yeah, we had to sort of – the first part of the conversation was like, do we think that there is a game here? And the answer was yes. And then it was like, okay, well, how do we address this feedback? Um, and I think we decided that because we'd been taking it to um, a local indie meetup in Montreal and having people play it, you know, super development builds sort of as we went. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the response was genuinely positive, and we had to trust in that response and have, you know, that players were like, yeah, this is cool, cool, this is cool. And so we knew there was something there. We just had to sort of expand it and find it. I think that if, like, you have a core mechanic, like in the, in the basic version of it, players are either confused by or they don't find it fun or whatever, then, you, then you've got a much bigger mountain to climb up. 
Um, I also think there was enough of what we built that was just mashups of things we already knew worked. I think we trusted that Breakout was still a game people had fun playing on some level. Sneaking a ball behind a, a bunch of bricks and watching it bounce around was still satisfying. Plinko is still satisfying and pinball is still satisfying that we could trust that if we could capture what worked there and add a little bit of Zelda to it, then, you know, we, we trusted that that would still make a game, you know? Mm-hmm. And I actually think that those references gave us the, we're kind of part of the decision to be like, well, do we, do we even keep going? Yeah. Cause you're at, cause you know, the, the question is good. Cause it implies that like, um, not what Nigel was saying is kind of like you should you should reevaluate what you're making, and once we did, we were like, well, we still know that these other basic games are fun, so we could. There's something here. We just have to work to find it. Right on. Uh, we we would still love to take questions in chat from folks. Uh, bring them on. We we invite them. We want to know if you're a game developer, if you're a game designer, and you have questions for Adam. Uh, please toss them in. Um, Adam, let's have some fun. Uh, there's, okay. this is kind of, this is kind of, I don't, I don't know, like, it's tough to ask about narrative and mood things in interviews sometimes because, yeah, sure. uh, you're better off served just playing the game, playing the game, tell you what it's about, but, uh, I think Creature in the Well, the reason, the reason I specifically responded to your PR team's email and said, yeah, we want to stream this game, is I looked at it and I saw that 10-foot skeleton and I saw the vibe of the little robot hero and I was like, oh, yeah, that's my jam. Like, it instantly clicked with me as a player. Um, what was kind of what other kind of ideas did you want to get across? Uh, like you talked about Mike McNeil as a source of inspiration, but like going deeper into that, what was kind of your with the sure. mood, the story? What was kind of your your vision for what this adventure needed to be about? Because Zelda yeah. is very, Zelda, for instance, is very save the save the princess, go on a hero's quest, and this is a little bit more Dark Soulsy. Um, reminds you a little sure. bit of Below. Like you you are sure. a yeah. I think you get what I'm going for there. Yeah, also, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, so the story um, of the game is kind of, like for the protagonist, it's about figuring out what your role in the world is. Mm -hmm. And for the theme, I think it's about being insulated. Mm -hmm. Um, The town of Mirage is stuck in a sandstorm. It's been stuck in a sandstorm for so long that the people don't know that oceans exist. They don't know what a trees, they don't know what trees or forests are. Um, And they, they think their entire world is uh, just the town and the mountain. And the creature likes it that way because he lives in the well and they wish to the well and they, you know, he gets to control their lives. Mm-hmm. I think he sees the ro- you as a threat because um, this machine might change all of that. Mm-hmm. And so thematically, everything that we wrote, the way the townsfolk react to you, um, the way the creature, what, what creature's goals are and what your goals are, what Danielle and Roger, the, the sort of main... Uh, NPCs of the game are all about it's about sort of like perspective mm-hmm. um, it's about like realizing the world's bigger than yourself and um, and the dangers of, of being too insular with all of that mm-hmm. I, like I mean that. I'm trying to talk about it without telling you how it ends yeah 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 no I think, <laughs> um, that's, I think that's valuable but like I don't know if you walk up if you walked up to any of these houses in the game but like you'll see that the people of town like you know they, they're, they're afraid of you Mm-hmm. Um, and they're that way because the creatures told them, you know, like, don't talk to this engineer, don't talk to this robot. He's, you know, he's threatening to change your way of life. And people, you know, can be afraid of change. Yeah. And um, and so that's kind of what the story is about. Roger um, is is helping you out because he's really excited about knowledge. And the thing that he really geeks out about is the machine he knows that his family was was part of making it but he's not totally sure how um and then danielle is uh is cool with you because she's old (laughs) and she knows better and um and so those two are the only two people in town that are really willing to help you on your journey against the creature but that's like you know we try to build the theme around that idea and build the characters who would help you, you know, making sure we were really clear about how they felt about mm-hmm. that theme and, you know, all is that. It, is there anything from your personal life that sort of drew that theme into into the story? Like the sense of Probably. This, a town that was insular <laughs> and not wanting to respond to people? Yeah, well, I mean, I, don't, I can't think of like an a exact example, but um, I think, you know, the, the best writing and the best storytelling you do has to come from something that you've lived. Um, but I, but I can't think of like an exact 
moment when I was arguing with my grandfather or something about about his point of view or anything like that. No, that, that's fair. Um, uh, let's see. We are uh, forty-five minutes into this chat. We got a few minutes left here. Um, uh, Adam, I guess you you know you're coming close to finishing this thing. Uh, um, what's been one of the most exciting parts for you, this latent development? Like, what's been one of the most exci- what's what's been exciting about getting here? I guess showing it to people is really the best part. Yeah. Um, it's it's funny. Like, you know, the end of the process is very technical and very tedious, and um, it's mostly on Bo's shoulders. And I'm trying to not annoy him <laughs> too much because it's it's just you know getting it on all the platforms and like making sure it runs different things break on different parts of it. Um, But like really, you know, getting to talk about it is a big, is sort of a huge milestone at the, towards the end of a project. Um, Announcing it and seeing how people react is such a huge thing. Mm -hmm. You know, development now is, is, isn't quite as sort of like announced release as it used to be. Like Mm -hmm. people know about games a lot earlier than they are released. And that's been a weird thing to sort of adapt to. we're used to much shorter productions, and so this is kind of the first time when I've been working on something for this long. It's been announced, and it still has a long time before it comes out. Uh, back in March, I mean, when we announced it, um, and and so it's just been really cool to see people actually be excited and actually anticipate the release, uh, which is soon, I promise. And um, and so that's always super satisfying. You you work on something for so long, and you love it, but you're not sure anybody else is going to love it. And then if people do, it's really nice. Right on. Um, kind of a there. Were, I had kind of a follow up. Oh no, I heard. I had a question, and I think I think it slipped out of my head. Um, it was something about. Oh no, did I die again? It'll come to you. Yeah. This, that, this was weird. Something weird happened here, and it's why I'm going to skip the puzzle when we get back. It's like the room, the puzzle like completed, and the bouncer was there when I got back, but it was still like wanting me to. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, you'll see it when we go through. I, I skip it at the end. Um. Oh, there was some, yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess um, uh, when it comes to, I guess like on some level, you're concerned a little bit with about selling your game and getting uh, interest sure. for it. Um, uh, what um, have you have you thought anything about how discoverability and how this game like obviously like you want a, a, your game to look? I didn't heal up when I okay. Thank God I healed up. Um, uh, have you thought at all about like what it takes to make a game that other people like? will care about which sounds kind of vague but at the same time it's the question that everyone's asking like you can make a wild unique game doesn't get anything or then you can make slay the spire and suddenly you're one of the most popular games on steam have you you been thinking about it at all about how your design process is affecting that yeah that's a slippery slope i think we talked about know, it earlier with the 70 30 thing yeah it's a, a bit of that a lot of that comes in but i think you know you do have to you could you could just make a br game and you know, try to try to like compete on that on that scale. Like, what's what are people playing the most of right now? Mm-hmm. Um, but that that's what I say. It's kind of a slippery slope where here it is. Uh, yeah, see the other the bouncers yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. You activated the final part of the room, but it wasn't completed. Um, I, I think you know we have we trust our we have to trust ourselves a bit mm-hmm. and say because Bo and I play a lot of games, so it's like what do we wish we could see that we're not seeing mm-hmm. is kind of where we start. Um, the 70 30 thing definitely comes into play I think you know unless you unless you give some player something to latch on to the newness might be too new it might be too difficult to get people to to, to check it out at all um, and I and I think we also decide to play to our strengths like you know we we haven't worked a lot of time but we've been working for about a decade and so we know what we're good at mm-hmm. um, and so we try to to pick projects that highlight the things we know how to do well, mm-hmm. uh, or work with people who are much much better at the other things than we are, um, and so I think we try. You know, the best thing to do is we're, the, the solution we've come up with is just try to attack that attack that problem like as logically as we can. Right on. Um, but you know, it's a gamble. It's a gamble. Like you, you have to trust your instincts. Like if I like this, maybe other people will like this. Um, Let's use enough of the genre stuff that we know people do respond to that like will fit within those games. Um, let's lean into our strengths and then um, let's try to make a big enough twist where we actually get some attention because people are like, that looks different. Right on. That is a great note, I think, to end the stream on unless anyone has any more questions. So I'm going to start 
the wrap-up process here. Thank you all for joining us on the GDC Twitch channel. Um, uh, if you have enjoyed this conversation, we'd love it if you hit the follow button because we're going to have more interviews with cool developers. Uh, as long, you know, as long as, long as the lights are on, we're going to keep doing them. Uh, um, that was grimmer than I anticipated, but don't worry. Uh, I, was, I was trying to lead into hyping up. We've got some really interesting interviews coming your way. We're going to be talking to the devs behind um, Age of Wonders Planetfall, which is out this week. We're going to be talking to them later this month. Um, we're trying to talk to uh, Richard Rouse III, a game designer who spends a lot of time at GDC, um, about his new game, Church in the Darkness, trying to make that happen. Um, there's some other great games coming out this fall that we want to be talking to the developers for, and hopefully we will do it with you right here on the GEC Twitch channel. Um, if you are a game developer yourself and you want to know more about uh, game making, we encourage you to check out GEC. If you've got a great talk idea, you can actually submit a talk for GEC right now. The, main, the, the core concepts talks are still taking submissions. Adam, if you want to submit something, that would be really cool. Maybe I should. Yeah. Um, uh, but then also look out for the Summit submissions will be opening up soon later this month. If you are a VR or AR developer, please join us at XRDC uh, this fall in October. Um, you can check out xrdcconf.com. I'll, uh, I'll put that in. I just put that in chat for you guys so that um, uh, you can check that out if you want. Uh, actually, and funny enough, um, Adam's coworkers will be there with their World War One game that I'm blanking on the name of. War Remains. It's called War Remains. War Remains, yeah. War Remains uh, with Hardcore Histories, Dan Carlin. They'll be showing off how they made it at XRDC. Um, so check that out, too. And that's all I've got for now. Adam, if they've got any questions about Creature in the Well, where should they ask them? Uh, you can follow Creature in the Well on Twitter at CreatureWell. Uh, CreatureInTheWell.com has all the links to all the stores and all that coolness. And that's it. Right on. Okay, with that, everyone, I hope you have a uh, happy Wednesday. I hope, you, uh, hope you're enjoying your summer. Um, stay cool, stay hydrated, and with that, have a good day. Bye. Bye.